Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. And each quarter, we take a look at the newest edition of the Wilson Quarterly with the help of its editor, Steve Lagerfeld. Steve, welcome back. John, thanks for having me. Also joining us is a contributor to the current issue. Sadanan Dume has written a piece on leadership failures in India titled India's Feckless Elite. Sadanand is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Welcome to you as well. Great to be here. Steve, tell us about the, the cover cluster and the, and the story, Will India Win is the big banner, and then we'll dive into your specific piece in a moment. Well, Joan, win is maybe a little misleading, but the question we had when we went into this was, uh, what is the future prospect for India, which is essentially the kind of liberal competitor, democratic competitor with China for, uh, for, the, for the title of model uh, for the developing world in the future? And the question we wanted to ask was, well, China uh, has uh, done pretty well with authoritarian market-oriented system. Uh, we'd much prefer the democratic uh, market-oriented system to prevail. And so we wanted to look at China, uh, India through that lens, and that led us to our guest. So, Danan, you begin by talking about the fact that India was one of the chosen countries in the world on the, on the path to prosperity, an accelerated path, largely unscathed in the 2008 uh, financial meltdown. Well, what went wrong on the way to uh, a straight line to world dominance? Well, I think it's always difficult when you're looking at development to make these straight line predictions. And I think the straight line prediction that people had begun to make about India, especially over the last 10 years when economic growth picked up, it was nearly at, uh, at double digit rates, was that this was going to go on forever and ever. Uh, instead, we find that this year growth may app, in fact dip below 5%, which is about half of what it was five years ago. Um, in a nutshell, what went wrong is, has two parts. The first is that there has been a global economic slowdown, which has affected India just as it's affected everybody else. But more importantly, there's been a kind of policy paralysis that has crept in in India's governance, and that's being driven by deep structural factors in the polity, which is what I examine in this uh, essay. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the things like 13 million new people entering the job force annually, uh, th this is a large number. Could any economy keep up with that, or are there particular problems in this ruling elite that are precluding it from making the moves necessary? I mean, the 13 million figure is, is really this at the sort of heart of the India story, right? Now, conventionally, when you speak of, of this straight line that's going up and up and everything heading towards certain prosperity, the 13 million is seen as a great strength. It's part of India's demographic dividend. India is a much younger society than most. Um, however, these are people who are going to be productive citizens only if they have jobs. And it's not clear whether the current policies that India is following and the current political system that engenders those policies is going to be able to generate those kinds of jobs. And that's really the sort of central question. The, the, uh, the massive power outage that occurred last year, or is it still this calendar year? Still this year. What, what, does, that, what does that say about the, uh, the infrastructure? Well, two things. On the, f on the one hand, to be fair, that's a one-off. It's not as though you're having power outages on that scale, affecting 600 million people all the time. So this so isn't tied to the malaise that you described. So as far well, as it's in and of itself. If you were to look at it, um, I think the only fair way to judge it is to say that that was a one-off. However, it's emblematic of a genuine underlying problem, mm -hmm. which is that infrastructure in India has lagged. That infrastructure, particularly in the power sector, has lagged. The reason it's lagged in the power sector is that you can't get people to pay, I'm simplifying it here, but the, the core reason is you can't get people to pay market rates for electricity. The reason you can't get them to pay market rates for electricity is that the politicians won't let you. And the reason the politicians won't let you is that they won't get reelected. And so that's a sort of, it this ends up being a political economy India, question. does it? <laughs> no, I, I mean, in the sense that, uh, you know, other governments deal with this. They've uh, condition there. Uh, you would say in this country, people argue all the time that Americans don't pay enough for gasoline, that because of government interventions that we're not paying the accurate costs of fuel. Is it, is it different than that? I, I think there are broad parallels in many democracies, but I think the outcomes are much starker mm -hmm. when you're in a place with them which is, remains much poorer. And so in India, what it could mean, it could mean the difference between having electricity and not. So I think that, 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 that that's yeah. the big difference, really. Stark difference. 
Yeah, the, and the government uh, the recently undertook a big initiative to, to sort of launch or relaunch some of these big infrastructure pro projects, and that seems to have stumbled again entirely, uh, uh, running into all sorts of political opposition. I mean, it, it's the thing that you talked about in your uh, piece so, so eloqu eloquently, I thought, was the s nature of the political system and how it, it really wasn't, it was standing in the way of getting a lot of things done. What, um, what, what, are the, what are the prospects of, uh, of, of, uh, of making a, uh, sorts of changes that they tried with the, <coughs> the sort of infrastructure initiative? So, you know, in the short term, I'm not very optimistic. Mm. Uh, in the long term, I am optimistic. I think the problem with the short term is that the politics is just going to be, you know, it's going to be held, the policy is going to be held hostage to this very fragmented and populist politics. In the long run, the big hope is that as the, educate, the size of the educated middle class grows, what you're going to see is a new kind of politics that is more clearly attached to sensible policies. And in some ways, if you could sort of see the beginnings of that in this um, widely covered anti-corruption movement we've seen over the past two years, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a messy process. I'm, that's fine. I mean, messiness is part of democracy. I would rather have a messy democratic process than a clean authoritarian one. Um, but the question for India, for, for infrastructure and for the economy more broadly, really is not that India is going to go backward, but will India go forward at the pace it needs to? And that's the question mark that we're sort of raising you, here. You're describing es essentially almost a race against the clock. How much time does India have? How much time do these improvements that you're seeing in the long-term trends, uh, how long will it take? Yeah, in, in a, it's, it's a race against the clock if we're looking at India, if our goal is to see an India which eradicates poverty more or less in our lifetimes, if our goal is for India to be everything that it can be as this prosperous democratic alternative to an authoritarian China, if, it's, if, if, if it is for India to fulfill all of its own promise for its own people and also fulfill what those of us in Washington who want India to do well think should be a geopolitical role for a country of its size and standing, um, then it's a race against the clock. If on the other hand you cut back, if you scale back your ambitions quite dramatically, it's not as though things are getting worse in India. Things will continue to improve, things will sort of get, get you know, slowly get better, two steps forward, one step back. And so of that I have very little doubt. So I'm not worried that India is heading to, towards uh, catastrophe. Not regressing. Right. But I am worried that it is uh, that that much of what we've seen written about India, particularly in the last few years, has been uh, somewhat hyperbolic. This this feckless Salish as the now is that the editor's uh, choice of word or is that your choice of word? Who is uh, who? Editor can't claim credit for that <laughs> one. <laughs> so uh, explain to us. What do we, let's do a profile of who these people are. One of the things, one of the stunning things you write in the article is about 50 families in the country essentially control the country. Was it 50? Was that the number? Yeah, I would be, you know, g give or take. Essentially, essentially, what you're seeing is that, you know, this is a country that gained, gained independence from the British. But there was a mass movement uh, led by, by, by Gandhi, of course. Now what you're seeing is that in state after state, politics is essentially becoming a battle between different families. And so 50 odd, maybe 60, essentially would run very large parts of the country. So if you can sort of go across the map, and if you go to Punjab, it's essentially a battle. The politics of Punjab is a battle between two clans. The politics of Tamil Nadu is a battle between two families. Uh, the politics of Uttar Pradesh, India's largest state with about, with about 200 million people, the new chief minister who is the youngest chief minister in India, that's equivalent to a governor in the US, uh, he's, he was essentially, he's, his father was a chief minister a few years mm -hmm. ago. So what you're seeing is political power handed down like an heirloom. And what's fascinating about that in the current context especially is that we read so much about China's princelings. And so what I'm talking about here is that princeling phenomenon, which to many people who cover Asia is something we associate with this authoritarian China, and it makes sense to us in an authoritarian context, is perhaps equally true, if not more true, of democratic India. 
And, and you also say that, the, the, uh, this is exactly the quote, founders were on average several notches above their present day successors. Today, nearly a third of the state and national legislatures have criminal charges pending against them. So one of the problems is that they're not performing at the same level as their predecessors. So it, it compounds the issue. Yes, I mean, I think one of the things that happened, and it's an unforeseen circumstance, and I don't want to knock Indian democracy too much because I do also mention that it has several strengths. Um, but the fact is that there has been no, the, the, there's, there's been no experiment on this scale in human history. And in a nutshell, India had universal suffrage before it had universal literacy. And add to that the fact that it has a first-past-the-post system, which really means that if you want to be elected to parliament or to a state assembly, often all you need is 30 or 35 percent of the vote. So add these two things, mass illiteracy and the fact that you need only 30 or 35 percent of the vote often to be elected, it sort of naturally lends itself to identity politics. The unity of identity in Indian politics is caste. And so what you see is that instead of necessarily the best educated, most capable people entering public life, you sort of see a different kind of politician emerge. Um, often not the best kind of politician in my view. Are there, one of the things we, we were lamenting before we began taping, the, the sort of the endless campaign that now takes part in America where even though we just elected, a, the pres re elected a president, uh, still people are lining up for four years from now already. But, but you're suggesting that a little more of that would be a big progress in politics in India that instead of these cult-like political movements that having a party that is driven by ideology is the type of progress that you need? Oh, absolutely. You need a lot more ideology in India. And you need a lot less, you need a politics that's are based less on personality. Are there any inklings of that beginning? Is, are there the beginnings of such movements? Well, you know, there's always been ideology on the extreme right and on the extreme left. So that's where ideology is, and most people are sort of, you know, on And how own. does that break down in India? In other words, uh, if an American audience hears extreme le right and extreme left, they hear certain things, they associate that with certain issues. Can you describe to us what that means in the context of India? So it's broadly speaking more, it's less about economics and, and more about uh, identity. So extreme, the extreme left would be similar to the extreme left anywhere. They're sort of communists, right? They're the communists and the, the right in India are the Hindu nationalists and they have their extreme elements and they also have their mainstream elements. Um, that's the kind of, uh, that's the spectrum. The Hindu nationalists would be very similar to Japanese nationalists. Mm -hmm. Uh, that would be the sort of the closest uh, in, 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 in Asian terms. And the communists are just communists. And everybody else is sort of in, in between these two. Both of those sort of the right and the left, they have a sort of clearly defined ideology. You can believe a, a certain set of things and become a member of that party as a young person and climb up the ranks. The rest of it in the middle is just some sort of, you know, it's broad, broadly populist, broadly socialistic. You know, and one of the things that interests me, when uh, the most surprising thing in your article to me was we talk about this, the broad middle, and we expect the middle class to be there and defining that middle. And of course, middle class is not all that large yet in, in India. But the, the stunning thing that you said in your piece is that essentially the richer people are in India, the less likely they are to vote, except with the obvious exception of uh, people in these you know, ruling families and others. Uh, less likely to vote, less likely to be involved in politics, more withdrawn, uh, more in their little islands, and partly, as you say, because of the corruption of the system and so on. But, but that seems like that defies our stereotype, number one, and, and doesn't seem very good for India. You're absolutely right. It's, it, it seems particularly counterintuitive if you're in the U.S., where you sort of always, you know, the way, where you associate the sort of political engagement, where the richer you are, the better educated you are, you know, you're, you're more sure. engaged with politics in some way. Uh, at least traditionally that's been the case. In India it's been the, the exact opposite. Um, it is, it's understandable in the sense that the, the middle class being so small, the educated class being so small, effectively was drowned out mm -hmm. by democratic politics. Um, you're, if you, if there's only one, if you have one vote, and that's mm -hmm. one vote out of a hundred, you're not exactly empowered to be part of the democracy. So that's one part of it. The other part of it, frankly, is that the richer you are in India, you're able to, in some ways, secede from all the dysfunctional aspects of the state. So people who are well off in India, they have private security. The kids go to private school. They have private doctors. They have power, private generators. 
So it's not even as though the, you know, the power cut that we're talking about, which, which, which you know, the people are not affected because essentially once you get to a certain level of income, you buy your way out of India in a way. Almost sounds like many states within the larger state. Yeah, so there's just, you know, you, and, and so if you go to these places, um, those are the, these are the people, let's just say sort of hypothetically you have, a, you know, this is not, I'm making this up, but this is true in reality. If you have a gated community next to a slum, mm -hmm. in that gated community with the private power and, all, and, and the kids going to private schools and all the rest, you're going to have a lot fewer people voting. What will it take for those people to, uh, to get into the game? Well, well, and we only have about a, a minute and a half left, un unfortunately, so it's a big question, but what will it take to move the, the hyper-wealthy within India who just don't have a stake in politics to become engaged in the, in the way that you describe? Well, I'm not even talking hyper-wealthy. I'm talking not about even hyper -wealthy. I'm not even talking about hyper-wealthy. I'm talking about people who, I'm talking about the educated professional classes. Well, that makes it even a bigger about, problem, because yeah, yeah. it's broader. Uh, um, I think it's going to, I think two things. One, there has to be a realization, and I think this is happening. There has to be a growing realization that if they are checked out from politics, they're going to get the kind of politician that they're seeing now. You're going to continue to get the kind of corruption scandals and so on. And the second is that once the numbers begin to change, and they've begun to change thanks to 20, 20 years of economic growth, once the numbers change and they become more politically viable, there's automatically greater incentive for them to be participating in the system. Is there anybody to watch? Are there any young leaders emerging that we should keep our eyes on? They are, but they tend not to be national leaders. They tend to be leaders, I think, in the states. Some of them in, in the states, like there's a, there's a yeah, young leader called uh, B.J. Panda in the eastern state of Orissa. There are several uh, several uh, leaders in uh, in, the, in the southern states, in the western state of Gujarat. The sort of smaller states where you have uh, state level leaders who are trying to reinvent this, reinvent Indian politics, and that's a very interesting process. Sadanan, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks Terrific piece. Uh, read the whole thing. That's thank my you. advice to our viewers and listeners. Stephen, I'll return in a moment to survey the world of ideas. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. Uh, I mentioned as we went to the break that uh, surveying the world of ideas is a tagline you've been using for a long time. And it's a pretty accurate description of the editorial focus of the uh, magazine. It's a big tagline to live up to, John. It is, a lot of pressure. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and not enough people uh, really to, uh, to totally do the job. We'd probably need about a million and a half, I'd say, to really survey the world of ideas. But it is very much what this magazine app is, uh, is about. Um, now, when you say magazine app, that, this is the first all digital issue. We there you go. should not mark this moment without uh, uh, mentioning that. Right. And so you're working on the terminology. We I still call it a magazine. You're doing magazine slash app? Uh, well, I actually call it a magazine, but, okay. uh, but uh, nobody's invented the right language for this yet. I mean, everything's new. It's uh, really a frontier. Mag app, maybe. I, I'm not a Luddite, Steve, but I am an old-fashioned guy. You know, so I'm print printing apps. out, print see, apps. printing the magazine so I can highlight right. it as I prepare right. for these discussions. We'll train you up, John. So, <laughs> so give us a bit of a tour. So let's uh, look at some of the things that are in this current issue and that illustrate this notion of surveying the world of ideas. Right. John, well, like all mag apps, um, or magazines, <laughs> or apps, or whatever we are, um, we have articles. And of course, that's what everybody wants to talk about. In this case, well, we were just talking about one of them. Uh, and it's part of our package. Every issue has a cover story, as we did in print, now in the app, uh, a cover story that's actually several stories. We call it a cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, it allows us to take a subject and do, in the classic kind of Wilson Center style, uh, a look at the subject from different perspectives. You know, sometimes we just slice it up in different ways. Sometimes we have opposing views or various views. Uh, on, like Sadat on Dume, who we spoke to just there moments you go. ago. There you go. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, we have a cluster, as we call it, on India. Will India win? Um, and our next issue, I'm, I'm uh, 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 happy to reveal uh, will be uh, is democracy worth it? Mm. And worth it? Is democracy worth it? And uh, I seem to be asking a lot of questions these days in our in our cover lines. And you know, I think it says something about the uh, uh, the world we live in right now. There's a lot more questions. Well, that's than, intriguing. Than, I can't wait to talk than, about that one. Than normal. 
Uh, at any rate, we'll have our cluster, and then we'll have two, three, four other articles on, on sort of uh, uh, unrelated topics. Um, generally, what we're trying to do here in this magazine, like the Wilson Center, um, is to reach into the world of ideas, reach into the academic world especially, um, and find those sort of cutting edge or interesting or forgotten or overlooked or whatever kinds of ideas and findings and research that's being done and bring that out H to, to a dummy like me. <laughs> uh, uh, but wait, so what, how, how responsive are you to the headlines and the news that's driving the 24-7 the news cycle versus looking for those hidden gems, those important things that are important but we're not really talking about. So how do you calibrate that? Well, John, even though we're digital, we're still quarterly for the most part. We have a website, of course, and we do things on the website, but our focus is on being a quarterly. Um, well, that's four times a year. Um, you can't be too headline driven. In fact, you have to be ahead of the news mm -hmm. as much as you can. You have to sort of see what's cooking and sort of think down the road, uh, uh, you know, in the best case. Sometimes we look, you know, way into the past and, and so on, but basically we're trying to see, see ahead. Sometimes we, we get way too far ahead and uh, we have a dud. and. You know, we have to wait 10 years for the rest of the world to catch up. <laughs> well, speaking of looking into the past, the, you have a, an article written by Maggie Paxson. Well, that's right. That's one of our, our two sort of feature independent articles in this. And uh, Maggie was, uh, was actually a guest scholar here at the center, uh, still associated with our Kennan Institute. She has uh, become interested in, she's an anthropologist by training, she's become interested in these uh, handful of villages on a plateau in south central Fl France. Uh, that during World War II became a refuge for Jews, and they saved about 30,000 Jews uh, at a great risk to their own lives. Well, this wasn't a, a kind of one-off event. It turns out that there's a history, there's a culture, there's a whole story behind this that really goes back to the 16th century yeah. when these villages were Protestant enclaves, preserves from a kind of marauding Catholic majority in France. Um, that ethos that established itself then still lives uh, into World War II and lives today when these places are refuge from, for uh, people from all over the world uh, fleeing political violence. It's fascinating. Maggie is really interested in, well, why? What makes this happen? What makes it survive? I mean, why uh, centuries after yeah. the original thing is, uh, is the culture of these uh, well, show places? Off, show off the technology. Show, Let pull me up do the article. That. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, we have here, by the way, um, Maggie's uh, good friend Lucian Perkins is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, photographer. And uh, Lucian uh, took a couple of pictures that we ran in here um, with an iPhone. And that's with one an, of them. This uh, one with an iPhone, very nice. Right. And uh, uh, we also, by the way, John, have an interview in here, a, a little short video interview. I'm not going to show it to you right now, but okay. we did with uh, Maggie about her her piece, but uh, you'll see at any this rate. forcing you to become not just a print guy, but a video guy as well. Well, forcing, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to do it. <laughs> of and, course. Uh, I've had a few warm ups with you, John, and uh, these have been great experiences, and so I enjoy doing them actually. And one of the things about having an app from going uh, from print to digital, uh, there are some downsides to it, let's face it. Uh, but there are a lot of upsides, a lot of really interesting things. One of the things is I can do color photos mm -hmm. um, that we can uh, Without give exorbitant you long, have printing costs. There you to go. go. With it. Um, I, we have a lot more flexibility. We can do video. Uh, we can let people can do what they want with the, uh, with the magazine. Some of the, uh, the, the standard things that we expect from the magazine, the book reviews, the Inessence section, still part of the digital world? Well, very much so. Um, I, that is where, John, we am going sort of backwards and then I'm going to go forward. I'm going to show you the, the table of contents, but um, where we really try to live up to our billing of surveying the world of ideas is uh, in our articles, but es uh, especially in uh, two sort of feature sections that we have here. One is our book review section, which is, you know, I think of it as a sort of boutique book review. We only review six books. Uh, in all different kinds of uh, uh, fields. Um, and um, 
uh, but we do them very well, very carefully. In this particular case, we have, as you Prescient can see, Prescient on the generals with Tom Ricks well, based on the current headlines. Uh, that is really one of the best reviews that we've uh, published in a number of years. Uh, Tom Ricks, who, by the way, was an editor at the Wilson Quarterly years ago. I did not know that. Um, uh, has written this, uh, you know, very controversial book about America's top military commanders. Um, One of the top military reporters, by the way. And uh, Tom uh, is, has been, also now a blogger at uh, foreignpolicy.com. Um, and he's fairly critical of America's top military commanders and sort of the military culture that bred them. Brian McAllister Lynn is a military historian and one of our foremost uh, military historians who also was here at the Wilson Center actually several years ago. And we asked Brian to have a look at uh, uh, Tom's book. And uh, so he's written a fabulous uh, review, uh, not only reviewing, but adding his own knowledge, his own perspective as, a, as an experienced uh, uh, military historian. And uh, so it's fabulous. We've gotten a lot of response from it. This is one that we have actually put out on the web, and we do that with some of these things. Um, I'm going to show you some of these other reviews here. By the way, you can always scroll down. So you don't need a, you don't need an iPad to. You can also do this online on a website can, as well. You can get some of our articles are free online, but the whole thing, if you're willing to subscribe, uh, is available as a PDF from our website, WilsonQuarterly.com. You can read us on the Nook, the Kindle, uh, the Sony e-reader, and you can print and, and highlight the and, way uh, I do. Uh, there you go. A uh, number of other things. Um, uh, and uh, so it is, it's available in um, 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 several different forms. Now, I'm, I'm going to sort of speed through this a little bit, John. Um, I want to get back. Show me one more thing, Steve, because we're short on time. Okay. Well, here's another section that I, uh, is really important to us. It's been in the magazine from the beginning. Mm -hmm. In essence, we survey, uh, go through hundreds of scholarly journals, uh, intellectual journals, all kinds of uh, publications. Well, thank you for sharing this. Congratulations on making the transition, and we'll look forward the next quarter to talking about that, uh, the topics that you previewed for us. Sounds fascinating. Is democracy worth it? Wow, provocative. That's all for this week's edition of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Until next week, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molusky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHC Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhcnetworks.org.